we can get started, I'll, I, I will introduce you, even though I should introduce myself first, I suppose, since uh, I'm a <coughs> visitor here at Ostrom this semester. I'm an economist at Clemson University, and Rob is an economist at Clemson University as well. Uh, Rob and I have worked together for uh, a long time now, probably, I don't know how long, 15 years, uh, maybe? A bit, a bit longer. A bit longer. <laughs> so, uh, but who's counting? And, and we've, written, uh, we've written a lot of papers together, and uh, uh, Rob had actually a very, um, a very uh, uh, impressive career before starting to write papers with me, if anyone can believe that. No, he's, he's written some really uh, very interesting, important stuff on the New Deal. He's written on political transition and communist countries. So Rob had a line of research that was going along that was sort of compatible with mine, and that was how we ended up writing together, uh, mostly on ancient Greece, but on a number of other topics, too. And this is one of those other topics. Uh, Rob has a PhD from Stanford. Uh, and he's doing just a bit of background, uh, dating back to 1995. And he and I actually began the same year at Montana State University, both as brand new professors. Um, and I guess that's an adequate introduction. It's a pleasure to have Rob here. It's a, it's a real treat, uh, I think, to, to have him talk about this paper. I'm going to let um, Federica moderate because she knows people's names better than I do. Um, uh, so I will basically now give it to Rob for his five-minute introduction. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Andy, and, and thank you very much for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure. I've gotten a bit of a tour around. You really have a, a great place here, uh, good people, and uh, good location. So thanks. Um, as Andy mentioned, we've written a long series of papers together, and <coughs> this is part of a series. Uh, one of the main things we've been interested in is the, basically when you have problems that the voters won't necessarily vote the way you want, including when voters vote today to set policy, knowing that future voters may prefer to undo that policy, basically what's the best you can do? So you don't shoot for the, the first best or the ideal outcome, but you go for the best feasible. And that's, that's what we're really going after here. And so the, the title of this paper is Increasing the Value of Property Rights by Limiting Transferability. And if you think about you know, the limiting transferability, in general, you know, when we like markets where people can engage in mutual gains from exchange. So when you have two parties and you know, we'd like to swap things, whether it's lunch or pay money for some services or something, uh, if you block those exchanges, you're, you're harming both parties. But there are reasons why you, it might be beneficial in some circumstances to do that. It's never going to be ideal, usually, but it may be the best feasible. And that's what we're going after here. So it's why, in contrast to a lot of, of situations when you're buying and selling goods, um, we're going to look partic partic in particular at government allocated goods, so the government setting policies. Uh, so it's not something like just going to buy your favorite hamburger, um, getting, a mutual, uh, getting a good hamburger for less money than you would be willing to pay for it or something. We're looking for government allocated goods, and in particular why sometimes when governments do that, it may make sense uh, to restrict tradeability. Uh, so that's, that's the basic idea. And uh, there's a, not a large literature on mechanism design and economics, but this is uh, Andy's, in my view, of our literature view of the early literature is Aristotle. And uh, I know you're not supposed to read quotations entirely, but I will read this one because I think it's, it's really a good one. Um, so Aristotle says, that the private land, part should be near the border and the other near the city, so that each citizen having two lots, they may all, all of them have land in both places. So notice, just starting from right there, this can't be ideal in the sense that that's not a, the right allocation of land if you want to maximize agricultural output. Uh, for example, you know, it's good to have specialization. Uh, so you, if that can't be ideal. Uh, but what he's saying, the reason why this is beneficial is it tends to inspire unanimity among the people in their border wars. And so what this means is instead of some people having their land on the, on the border and other people having land in the city and then going to vote on whether you should fight a war, and then having a split division, a political division over this. If everyone owns two plots of land, everyone's basically in, has the same stake. They're sort of in the same boat or in the same two boats. Um, so you, <clears throat> you're going to get more agreement. So what you're giving here, giving up here, is gains from exchange or gains from specialization. However, we look at it in exchange for more agreement on the collective decision. Um, so I mentioned it's not ideal for agricultural output, but it promotes good decisions. Um, and then, key thing here, in other words, Aristotle's recommending a second best. He's not going for the ideal, he's going for what he thinks is the best feasible. Best feasible given voters' incentives. And what we do in our paper is we develop a theoretical model and then discuss some applications that build on this idea. So I'm not going to go through any of the model, just jump to the, uh, to the uh, basic ideas for the applications here. Um, so we want to think here, in, if, based on what we've talked, I've talked about already with Aristotle, think about the, the basic logic. Um, what about rights to hunt 
or to fish. You allocate non-tradable rights. For example, you enter a lottery to get a hunting tag, so permission to hunt an elk or a bighorn sheep, for example. Uh, that's clearly going to lead to misallocation if those rights are non-tradable. So I might get a tag to bighorn sheep. Dean would be happy to buy that from me, but he can't because it's not tradable. Um, so what we're doing then is both of us are worse off because of the non-tradability. So this can't be ideal, but what this might get you is better alignment over, say, game management decisions. And the important thing is here, it's while you're behind the veil. As soon as, if, if you don't know whether, when you're going to win this lottery, and you're trying to make collective decisions, for example, about managing game, do we want to hunt more elk this year, and, you know, or less elk this year, hunting that less elk this year, you're going to wind up with more elk next year to hunt. If you don't know which year you're going to win that lottery, then you've basically got a probabilistic stake in the game over all the future years that you might be in the lottery. So it's not going to be a perfect alignment, but it can, it can get better alignment. And there's, there's <coughs> more to that, but that's just a very briefly, I'm trying to stay in my five minutes, <laughs> that's, that's the explanation there. Um, another application would be to think about rent control and building permits. I think, for example, San Francisco. So the puzzle here, you know, I think is easy to think about. In San Francisco, we know they have quite a bit of rent control. We also know that they have extremely high rents, some of the highest of anywhere. But despite having a lot of tenants and high rents, there's not much building that's happened. So very few building permits are issued. Um, so why might that be? In this case, we know that the non-tradability of rights to live in a house or an apartment is going to lead to a misallocation. And the, the non-tradability here, for example, rent control, is that if I have a rent control apartment in San Francisco, I have the right to live there and pay far below, often typically far below the market rent, uh, but I don't have the right to sublet that. So the, the inability to sublet is going to lead to deadweight losses, basically. You've got a misallocation. But you know, what do you get from the misallocation? Here we get more alignment. This isn't necessarily for a valuable purpose, such as Line incentives of hunters over game management. Here, the alignment is, is what we've explained in the paper is likely to lead to alignment in order to maintain the majority. Um, tenants would be aligned against tradability, so not allowing subletting, because by allowing subletting, you would then have market pain, market rate paying tenants move into, say, San Francisco. They, of course, then would favor building apartments. Okay? So, this is going to change the political decision. So if you are a, a tenant in a rent control apartment, you have something to lose. You have something to gain from subletting, but you have something to lose in the sense that the newcomers will have very different incentives than you do with respect to voting. And it's not just so simple as they might undo <coughs> rent control. They're going to change the number of permits. Okay? Um, and also aligned against market rate construction. So the so-called NIMBY behavior of homeowners not wanting to build more housing uh, in the sense that you know not wanting to build more housing because I already have mine, so they're not in my backyard, the additional housing may cause crowding. Even if the additional housing is way more valuable than it costs to build, you may have homeowners oppose that. You would also have tenants in rent-controlled apartments aligned with that. Um, a more general point here that's underlying this is that voting is a bad way to set prices. Actually, in the paper, we start off with that because that's a fundamental point to make. So it's not like you almost start off comparing to a first best or like a market outcome. <laughs> if you're looking at a government decision to set prices or equivalently setting the quantity to be auctioned off or equivalently setting the quantity to be allocated with a lottery but tradable. Any of those things, voting is going to lead to an inefficient decision. So what the model shows is that the first best price, so you know the efficient price here where price is equal to marginal cost, the marginal buyer will prefer a price change in either direction. A price change up will then, if if, well, we've, as we've assumed in the model, if the, the voter, or you're the, uh, you're, when you're voting, the, the marginal buyer, so someone who's willing to pay about marginal cost, if we have, what they do is raise the price, they're going to get a share of the monopoly rents. For example, if you can sell off building <coughs> permits. Um, however, if the they, price isn't going to go up, they would also prefer the price to go down below the efficient quantity because those costs are going to be partly borne by other people. So you have this fundamental problem with voting not leading to the efficient outcome. If you start from that perspective and then go back and think about what we've discussed with these other outcomes, it makes sense that there would be additional restrictions on trade in some cases. Because what you're doing is instead of going from a bad voting outcome, you may actually go to a non ideal outcome that's not quite as bad. So I think that's my five minutes. Okay. 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 Ok
So I have two questions. First one is mine, and the next one is from Gustavo Torrens, who's up there. Uh, <laughs> so my question is, is there anyone else? Well, he's in that. Well, that's but, but he's also that south. He's in Argentina. He's also south. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the clarification. So my first question is, is there anyone else in this room whose alma mater is playing in the final game tonight? <laughs> <laughs> is that Gustavo? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was not Gustavo's question. Uh, so Gustavo has several questions, and I'll, I'll ask you uh, one of them. I'll, I'll just read from, from it. So when non-residents become voters, if residents prefer to keep the monopoly price, why not allow entrance of non-residents just an epsilon below the point where be, they will be willing to switch the price? I guess that is equivalent to a constitutional provision requiring monopoly pricing. Is this correct? Yeah, that's the right idea. I think we, we, what we look at there is a se several types of restrictions in the simple form that are going to be equivalent. But one is maintaining the monopoly price, and other is if you have new residents who come in if they can't vote. Um, and so in this case, what Gustavo is, is proposing is something that would basically exploit the gains from exchange that you can up to the point where you're not going to change the, the voting outcome. So yeah, that, that would work. So I have a follow-up on that. I, I don't understand what it means to say not have non-residents who get to vote. Because all of this stuff that I'm aware they're of... They're in, initially non-residents, and then they move in. And so it makes sense for housing. In, in real policies, there's tremendous uh, energy put into defining what it means to be a resident for a particular purpose. Yes. And that's sort of not... I don't know how that fits into your model here. It's sort of left out. that You can easily become a resident, but that's not easy, actually. I mean, it's part of the... It's, it's part of the it's part of the joint package of the pricing and the resident non-resident discrimination that they have in, say, education or hunting and fishing and, and so on. I don't know how that changes your analysis. Of, well, it's part of the idea. Yeah. I think part of the idea is that what you're doing is you're, you know, there's some circumstances where you really are going to want to restrict that set of voters, and the whole thing breaks <clears> down <throat> if you don't restrict it. In other circumstances, but, but, but it can be difficult. For example, somebody buys a house and moves in, they become a voter. There's nothing you can do about it. But that's the rules. They well, can't. That's actually not true. So in hunting and fishing, you you don't become a resident by buying a house. You don't become a resident and moving by in and making it your full time residence. Well, yeah, that's a big. That's an absolutely, that's, yeah, absolutely that's, the same. Well, the same thing for voting in local elections, right? I don't know if you can necessarily vote in a local election, but these are endogenous absolutely. rules, and these are all part of this whole idea that you you are de you are defining in the process. So yeah, you're raising a good point. I think that's a very important point. You know, and this is, uh, of course, the model is just a schematic, but that's one of the ideas is that, the, you know, the non-resident versus, re you know, voting population is endogenous. You're, as voters, you are going to set the rules that's going to determine under what circumstances somebody can, can become a voter. And, uh, and you're also you know, often going to make those very restrictive because they may undo this, this sort of, you know, situation that we're describing here. Yeah, no, one more thing on that is that, about those difficulties, if it's something like apartments being sublet, if someone comes in legally to sublet an apartment, then they really are there. If they're a citizen, they get to vote in the local election. So mm -hmm. unless you're going to just allow tenants. So in that's a case where it would be very difficult to exclude through a rule like that. Um, I mean, a follow-up application would be uh, homeowners associations where you, you, you become a citizen by just buying. If, you know, if I buy an apartment in San Francisco, I'm not a citizen. I still can't. So you, I don't know how that changes your, your analysis or maybe change an application or alters the potential application. So you're saying, say, you, you want a condo in Florida or Hawaii and you're not a resident, but you join the homeowners association. Yeah, you buy, then yeah. you become a resident. You essentially become a resident. A resident, yeah. 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 That, would, that would make sense, and there's a lot of reasons. I think this also fits because it, your willingness to pay, if someone's selling you a condo, your willingness to pay for that condo is going to depend on whether you have a say in the policy. Not just you, but you and other people like you. So I think that I think that fits. Michael. Yeah. Um, so I think that your model and your logic is more actually applicable to 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 these apartments. But you start out your paper with while the game hunting, and there I wasn't sure. I mean, voting. I don't. So I'm not sure how it works, but my guess is that if Indiana allows for hating, for hunting deer, uh, the voters, so 
would be all the citizens of Indiana and the potential hunters is only a small subset and so that logic really is not applicable to a large extent, right? But more important maybe, uh, usually, at least it has been my reading of these kinds of restrictions, at least explicitly, the, the goal would be to improve income distribution, or at least not to make it worse. And so I think that your, your paper would benefit if you, if you address the argument that these things are done in order uh, to give everybody equal opportunity, if you will. Uh, I think actually that with hunting, it might be a more relevant explanation, again, because it's all citizens who vote and well, they don't want some rich guy to come in, and uh, I don't know. Uh, so you mentioned that in developing countries, it's actually, it would be different, all right, <coughs> but that's uh, it's a different circumstance. With, 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 so with rent control, I don't, I mean, so people they also talk about inequality, but I suspect it's not the main reason, so I believe in your logic more. So it depends, I mean, so I think you need to address the inequality argument. I think that's, that's a good point, and I, I think we, we can work more of that in. I would say that just two, two quick things, though. The, with respect to the voting, what you're going to see in, in states in the United States is that, that the hunting policy is largely going to be run. It's going to be overseen by a, basically by big bureaucrats who are you know, basically overseen by the, by the representatives that the voters elect. So there's a lot of links there. But I do think you'd still find that even if you thought it's interest groups competing, there is something to this, to the, to the, the voters are influencing this. And in some states, I think it's, it's a big deal. In Montana, for example, I mean, hunting rules are, are, are a big deal. So I think voters would undo it. But I think you also just want to think about, if it, even if it is interest groups lobbying a bureaucracy, why do these things persist? So why would it be the case that we'd see so many non-market allocations? And then the income distribution is clearly a lot of it. I mean, people prefer more wealth to less. Uh, for themselves usually. But there's also a, a, a question of if you allocate these rights, say a poor person gets a right to hunt a very valuable animal, uh, that poor person is it benefits from winning the lottery, but they would benefit more from winning the lottery if they could sell it. I know, yeah. of course. So there's gotta be there's gotta be something there's gotta be something else going on. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So just to follow up first of all, I meant precisely that it's the citizens of the state who vote, and if it is all citizens and hunters are only a small subset of them, then the logic of your model doesn't really apply that much because, because, because most voters basically are not directly benefiting from winning or losing a lottery. See, if it's a small subset, who benefit from the lottery, so in voting is a much larger set of people, it's a different model, right? Oh, well, I, I think you could, we could also model the bureaucracy. It's, we were, we, we've thought of doing that, but I think it is a different model, but I think well, we, you know, we're just trying to get a piece of that here. And I, I do think that the fundamental problems with, you know, we're illustrating with respect to voting on a price, I think those still will apply, because however, the, however you know, the subset of voters that really care However, their preferences are working through the political system. You know, it's still there. And I would also, you know, our, our general presumption here too is part of the reason why you would have a lot of, you know, sort of a kind of a, a fish and wildlife department overseeing this, and you delegate power is to get around these decisions. So there's not so much. You don't want to, because we, you know, voting is a bad way to set prices. In that case, you you might be better off having an imperfect bureaucrat set prices. Wouldn't the willingness to pay take care of the kind of like a miss, like the gap between the the subset of voters and the the, the subset of people that have a stake in a decision versus the larger subset of voters? Um, and I wonder. The, my question was actually similar, and it had to do with like how the model changes based on public goods, because Aristotle is talking about very peculiar, uh, um, very specific goods, right? It's defense and agriculture. You feed yourself and you protect your family. Yeah. These are like at the kind of like, it's, this is not like wild game. Um, so I wonder like if there is, if, if, if the 
hyper public good has an implication, um, and in a, in, in in a way, whether the um, people like the, the the strength or the intensity of preferences vis-a-vis -vis the decision has an impact on the, on how the model works out. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent point, and that's one of the things we we have not fully worked out yet. Um, the, we, we have on paper a few versions of how things work out with respect to public goods. So we describe some of that in the, this is the first draft. Um, but that's, I think that's a really important point. Uh, you're, and you're exact, exactly right. Aristotle's talking about defense as the public good, which is very different than, than right. game. Right. And so I think that's, a, you know, that's something yeah. we, we really haven't worked all that out. Yeah, well, and, and, I mean, let me, let me actually yeah. push back on that a little bit. I mean, so even, even voters, even voters, if most voters aren't hunters, they may still care about the animal population. And one of the things that that's, you're doing with this kind of system, by because basically if your goal was simply to make hunters better off, you could imagine that you, know, you, 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 you have a lottery where every hunter gets it, and those that win, you know, it's like hallelujah, and then they, you know, that's just like you've won a, lot of, a real lottery, a cash lottery, they sell to someone else. But at that point in time, of course, then that affects who enters the lottery, and it, it, it brings about a bunch of other changes. What this does here is this is a way where you basically you get alignment about the population of animals there, and you make that at sort of this kind of sustainable level, and that would be the notion. So even if you're a voter who doesn't want to hunt, this kind of thing, I mean, this is what we argue anyway, will lead to an allocation of animals that you may like. And this comes back to the point that, you know, this is, voters are supporting these laws. Voters could have different laws, which is basically, we just auction off the game permits to the highest user, and then all of that money gets returned as rebates to each of us, or gets used for schools or something like that. I don't understand it. Uh, your point is that behind the veil, it is all... Uh, we don't know who will be a voter, and who, and who will be a hunter, and who won't. So it is all second best. I'm saying that if there are five million people, so in Indiana and only, say, 5,000 are potential hunters, these five million people want optimal number of animals to be hunted and get the maximum price for it. Essentially, 99% of the people are, so are not participants in this lottery. No, but they're 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 voting for the system, though. So they, they they do want. The question is, why would they then want a lottery? Why not set the number of animals to be killed and the price? They do, they do. Yeah. but they allocate the right. They set the number of animals to be killed, which is equivalent to setting the this price in a certain sense. But they, what they're doing then is they're saying who gets to kill them, and they're allocating that. Prices. Yeah, well, yeah. They, yeah, they've got in the state versus out of state. Yeah. This has non resident versus resident price. That, that's a good and point. They usually too. price discriminate. Right. So they're maximizing the income. <laughs> so different people have different demand curves. Right? And the out of state residents, we saw this in Colorado as well, it's like Montana. So I think you're, you're maximizing the income subject to the game management in some way. Yeah, and one thing to remember too is that, that these rules, you're pointing out that. These rules aren't set by voters. That makes sense because what voters would want to do for the future is make sure these rules are not set by voters. So you're going to have, a, you know, the, the, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if the state of Indiana has in its constitution some kind of provision for managing game in, in the public interest. But your model works because everybody, uh, because every voter has. Uh, to a large extent, it works, I think, the way it does because of uniform distribution. And what I'm saying is that the distribution is highly non-uniform. Okay. Most voters have zero uh, willingness to pay for hunting. So it is just a blip at the end uh, who are, not, are real hunters. So all I'm saying, I like your model. It's just, <laughs> yeah. it's just I'm saying yeah. that it probably is not quite applicable to the situations where the subset of people willing to pay <clears throat> is significantly smaller than the, su uh, than the set of voters. 
Yeah, no, I, I understand your point, I, and yeah. I think it's a really good one. But I, I, you know, but another way to look at this is if, if you're writing a constitution for a state and you expect that there's going to be hundreds of policies where the people with positive willingness to pay are a very small percentage, then what you want to do in advance is set up a system so you're not going to subject those all to majority rule voting. Because majority rule voting will lead to essentially a monopoly price. So if what you see in, in Indiana is that hunting is not priced at the, at the monopoly price, which would maximize the profits, you know, the collective profits for the non-hunters, if that's what you don't see, there's a reason. I think our model doesn't tell you what's happened. I mean, and we'll, we'll try and address that in a different paper. But I think what our model is telling you is why you're not going to do that, right? There's a reason, if people are setting up these rules, say, writing a constitution, it's reasonable to think that they're behind the veil on a lot of things, and they're going to set up different different systems other than voting on price. Yeah, this this follows this. Um, so first of all, I I this is I think more than semantic. It's really an Ali Williamson point. The best feasible is the best. But it, it so that Rob's shaking. Go ahead. Andy shaking, yes. But so I always hate this where economists play this nonsensical game of saying this is the first best. Well, that's really silly. In a world of positive transaction costs or multiple incentives uh, behind the veil of ignorance, you want to credibly commit uh, to a few. It's the alarm clock in the room problem. Right? You set it not next to your bed, but you set it across the room so you get up and once you're up, you stay up. So I never thought this, of that. What? <laughs> that. Um, so, so this is. So I, I that point made. Um, I'll uh, uh, beg to, to disagree with my colleague Michael that I actually think the hunting uh, and fishing example is extremely apt, uh, but the rent control and <laughs> permit is not even close for the reasons that Michael said. Uh, having lived in a, in a place for a while, Boulder, where they had all these, uh, they had both subsidized rents, they had, if you build a new uh, you know, unit, so many units have to be uh, for lower income housing. Uh, the same things in Santa Barbara, Gary Leibcaps in one of these units where one or two of them are for lower income people. Uh, Gary's not there yet, I don't think. <laughs> but, uh, relative to Santa Barbara, you might be. But, but so I think it has a lot to do with not, they're, they're not a majority. Um, but I can think of other circumstances where I think your model fits better. And it gets really complicated. <laughs> I think Michael's right. I think it has to do with this notion of um, you know what's in everyone's objective function, the voters. So we may want a more di Boulder was we want a more diverse citizenry ended up not getting it, so they wanted assistant professors and staff to be able to live in Boulder. But they didn't buy this affordable housing because it was way too little and tiny. They still moved out to the suburbs. So you got different constituents than they really targeted for, um, taking advantage of this, which says it's very difficult. But I think there are other ways that you can do this where you, you're, you're afraid of things flipping in a sense, in, in period two or three by voters. Um, and I think of, of uh, water sales by irrigation districts. I know that the Imperial Valley Water District sold water to San Diego, uh, which and they could have sold it all. So in your view, the first best would be just get out of farming, move to the Caribbean, and sell your water to San Diego. But they said they will only sell the amount of water that they save through going to high efficient drip irrigation. And when they were, were queried about this, they said it was, they thought that if they got completely out of agriculture and fallowed all their land, that that would cause voters to say, hey, game off, you guys no longer have the property rights to this water. So there's this fear of what could happen. And I think that fits this, this one to some extent where um, the voters, voters have this. Um, so I think that's important. And then I was just wondering how much you can, 
this would be kind of an extension, but it gets to what Dean was talking about is how much you can control residency. They're pretty strict about this for education, but we're also strict about this with respect to citizenship. In some countries, like Switzerland, as far as I know, there's no way in hell you can ever become a Swiss citizen. Uh, you can't marry into it, you can't, you know, it's, you gotta be Swiss. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's true, it's very, very strict. So that, um, it's interesting, I think this has some implications. You can allow yeah, residency, but not it's citizenship. It's both. You can allow, yeah, you can allow residency, but not voting rights. And, and to what extent would this, or this is somewhat of, here's the thing, is somewhat of a justification for why countries and municipalities and states do it. But then think of the opposite. Why do some states have such low barriers? Um, now this is secondhand, but I was told my ex-sister-in-law is now a resident and citizen of South Dakota. And she did that because they don't have income taxes. And all she had to do was get a post office box. So she, and she has to be there once a year or something for 10 days. So the, the hurdle's really low. So why would South Dakota, you wouldn't think they'd make that much off of it. Post office because well, otherwise it would be an empty state. <laughs> <laughs> well, it still is. They just doesn't have a bunch of post office boxes. <laughs> it's full of post office boxes. So, uh, so are there states that really go the other extent? I don't know. Yeah, those are those are really good points. Um, so it's just in terms of I think yeah one of the things that since since the sort of summary is applies to the, the content of the questions and comments here, it does seem like one thing we might want to do in the model is make something more explicit about, about flipping. Um, yeah. That's actually something that's, that's it's been one of my research interests since I was a grad student, which was a while back. Yeah. Um, but sort of the idea of the, the role of swing voters in the, mm -hmm. and also yeah. who's going to flip within a key constituency. So I think that that would be, you know, that's something that we can do that would, might be an extension of the, change the theoretical model, might be an extension there where we get it to be not, not just look more realistic, but actually get some better implications. And I think that would exceed the front my guide which of these stories fits better. <laughs> Glad at least a, each of you finds one of them. I think the water example is a really good one. That's one of the things that we talked about years ago um, in terms of sort of this, this interesting puzzle. Why are these so many deadweight losses of misallocation yeah. of water in California? So if it is something about the alignment, so, so that's, a, that's a great idea. And the, the controlling residency is a really good one. We've talked about that, but hadn't, hadn't really brought this in. But that does make sense that we could look at that another aspect, and, and I had not, I, I had not thought of Switzerland, uh, but I, I, my impression is the same as yours. That's a really good example, because being, being a Swiss citizen would be really valuable, but it, it's also very valuable to the Swiss to have, to have low-wage workers. The last person I talked to that called herself a low-wage worker in Switzerland was making a very high salary as an economist. <laughs> She's German. <laughs> yeah. So it would make sense for the Swiss that they would want high-skilled Germans to be able to move in, um, and I don't think Germans are very afraid the Swiss are going to you know, abuse them or something you know, for being non-citizens. So it's a, it's a nice trade, but that way they can bring people in without worrying about changing the, any kind of an outcome. So yeah, we, should, we, should, we should extend that. Yeah. Especially because they're so decentralized, Switzerland, mm -hmm. to the right. Canton right. level of decision-making. That, yeah. that they're not, and you know, you've got the French-German divide in Switzerland. So there's lots of, it's a really deep, you, very unique state, but I think Stark State table to make your point. And on the flipping, I was thinking recently too about, I mean, it used to be that in a majority voting system, everyone, we should have a median voter model, but now uh, politicians are more polarized than the, the citizenry, which would suggest that you can get these, more likely to get these flips. So if you have a, a, a citizenry that's not bell-shaped curve in terms of their preferences over all kinds of outcomes, you would you would care a lot about flipping. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, it, but it's also interesting because people have talked about this with respect to gerrymandering, so that both sides gerrymander, and that you, we may all be better off, well, citizens would probably be better off without gerrymandering if they just did it in like a grid system. Uh, 
but it seems like it's in it's a down the road decision. Is it in anyone's interest to adopt that, even if you're in the minority now? So it's it, I I don't know the answer to that, but I think your model has a lot about uh, aligning incentives and this credible commitment in time t plus n. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. But part of what we were trying to do is keep things, show that you could have this even with a uniform distribution. Right. So just a straight line demand curve. For yeah. people. You, sure. We were trying to show that you can get this, the findings we do, but it would it would be useful to, to bring in something more along the, the log rolling. And I, the, the, actually, the polarization point is a really interesting one. In that you know the log rolling presumably in the United States works differently than it would have before. Yeah. Now yeah. that you know basically yeah. all Republicans now are on the right. And all the Democrats are pretty much on the left. If you look at sort of a pool rose and fall liberal exactly. conservative dimension, yeah. and that's going to really change. It's going to change the, the influence of the people that are outvoted in each each type of district. And so for 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 us, that might be something that that would actually lead to an empirical test. So it yeah. would be interesting interesting to look at. So yeah, yeah, actually, let me let you. me just yeah. comment quickly on Lisa. Oh, did you know, oh, no, go for it. You know, no. I was just going to comment on your point about. Uh, Williamson. I think that's great. I mean, we, we use the term second best efficient, meaning efficient subject to the constraints. Yeah. In other words, it just, it's just a language. But basically, the notion would be someone could look at the Aristotle comment and say, well, don't you want to both allow trade and have, you know, and have these aligned incentives? And what we're saying is, no, there's a constraint. There's a, you can't have both. You've got to have one or the other. So it's, it's a term we use, basically, though, to highlight that there's, you know, this perfect world out there that's unachievable because of these kinds of constraints. I, I mean, I, did, I don't think we're saying anything differently than different than what you're saying. It just it's just that's the term we're using. Yeah. So no, the first, when we say the first best, that's just sort of on the on the chalkboard. That's what maximizes surplus. The second best is what you can actually achieve given real world yeah. constraints. That's yeah. Yeah. I think. Yeah, we're definitely in line. But what I was thinking when, with your comment is, I think especially where we're explaining that part of the deadweight losses we're seeing is coming from a commitment problem. That that would be something I think. Just sort of say, here's the best you can get, and then attribute what would you be able to gain if you could have an external third party enforcer or something like that. That's another way to look at that that might be actually clearer to the yeah. readers. We're going through. And is there anybody else? Michael wants to. Uh, I have a question. Um, it's unrelated. Well, some of them. I used to and still do have difficulties explaining why, say, in the Czech Republic, when they did their, their privatization scheme, they prohibited trading. Uh, so they allocated essentially shares in companies uh, to voters and then said, well, so you cannot trade for like three or five years, I don't remember. I don't think your model is applicable to that, but <laughs> you tell me maybe it is, because I could not figure out what sort of rational argument uh, there would be. And of course, in Russia, when they did these vouchers, they allowed trading. Uh, so it was two schemes, two voucher schemes uh, that were different in this one respect. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. Thanks. Actually, I, I realized I, I have a paper, J. Leo 2000, that I wrote, as I mentioned before, All right. I was interested in transition from communism, but that yeah. actually part of my, my interest there was exactly your point, and so this is something for us to think about. It was the idea of my, the other paper here, <laughs> was that if you're trying to commit to a combination, democratic, you know, sort of market or you're letting people invest and keep their, keep their returns, if you're trying to commit to that kind of a transition, one of the problems is that some people basically, over time, gain more, have more at stake of maintaining sort of your property rights, not redistributing, and other people have less. So you sort of have winners and losers. That and that can derail your transition. And uh, what you might want to do there is, is again, go for some kinds of restrictions that are not ideal, uh, including, say, it would, what's in my model is delaying something like the establishment of a of a tax authority. But equivalently, what you can do there is is force everyone to have some kind of a stake in the gains, even if the net gains are smaller. Um, so we might, but I, I'll, we should, I'd have to think about whether the check, I, rem, I, I recall the check example was one of the things that inspired me. Yeah. But I'll have to think about what that is. But I don't think your argument would work there because, because people could use their vouchers to buy shares in any company. Mm -hmm. 
So it's not like everybody got equal share in everything. And when you get, so after you have used your vouchers, you basically are stuck with, with those shares as far as I remember. And then, well, some people are going to have a greater stake because, because I don't know, their companies are going to do well and some not. So I'm not sure if that, if that argument works. As opposed to selling to foreigners, though. Right. Well, the prohibition was, it was on sale to anybody. You, mean, you could not trade, as far as I recall, you could not trade your shares. For, for some period of time, I yeah, 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 yeah. But I, but I thought the, the allocation of the I was just shares just to check. checks. I, I, oh, yes, yes. As opposed to, if you had allowed, if you had allowed Czech citizens to sell, sell their stock, say, to me, yeah. right? So I bought a Czech citizen stock, right? Now, we, this, we may both be pleased with the transaction. Sure. Individually, that's not going to, that in, one transaction won't swing the political outcome. Sure. But you, you, if you're a Czech citizen and I'm, I'm not, you may want to block all trades in order that all Czechs, when they go to the polls, sure. have a stake. Sure. I think that does, but that's the spirit works. of our model. It works. It works with respect to sale to foreigners, maybe. So, far, so as far as I recall, everybody was given the equal number of so-called points mm -hmm. yeah. that they could use to buy shares, but they could not trade shares after they bought them. At least that's. Well, that, yeah. Actually, let me respond. What with I that, recall with another example, and I may not be remembering this perfectly, but when I was living in London, uh, Margaret Thatcher privatized uh, several of the companies, the water company and something else, and she basically, on purpose, underpriced the shares, yeah. um, and every only UK citizens had the right to buy the shares, and they could buy them um, for this underpricing, but they had a limited number of shares they could buy, and uh, they had to sell them for some period of time. And her goal, as she, as she, she called it, was creating a shareholding society. And I think you could sort of think of that in terms of something like this, as you're trying to align incentives regarding you know, investment and economic growth in a more market-oriented approach, which is, I think, what she was trying to do. And the way you do that is by making, you know, making sure there are a lot of people out there who basically share a stake in how the stock market does. Similarly, she privatized a lot of the public housing, letting people buy their own houses at, again, reasonable prices, but with the caveat they had to hold on to them for a share of time because that's what she was looking for. And so this, this ban on tradability that wasn't permanent but was temporary was sort of, I think, a bit like our model in the sense that it aligned incentives. It meant that, you know, all of a sudden you had a lot of people who were interested in you know, uh, who, had a, who had a stake in, uh, in property values. You had a lot of people had a stake in how the economy did through the share prices. But then you only need to prohibit sale to foreigners because... No, but you... Well, no, somebody because, else buys no, my it, apartment it, it, if it, another citizen... No, but it works within as well. So let's say what happens is what happened in Russia. Somebody, you know, a few big businessmen go around and they buy a lot of these shares and then all of a sudden most people have no stake in particularly and how these companies do, but these these small group of people have a, a, an enormous stake. So what you're doing is you're making, it, it doesn't have to just be residents and non-residents. Within the set of voters, what you're doing is you're aligning incentives. I mean, a better example, I think, is Telebras in, in Brazil. So what they did was when they privatized, the government retained uh, a very high share. Um, and the reason for that is you can ex post expropriate a company by regulation. So to credibly commit that we're not going to screw ourselves, uh, that we're not going to screw the people who buy Telebras, oh, so, so, so that it would, would be, sure. it would be this period T problem. And the, Wallace, Sill, and Legler have a paper about early state banks that showed that if a state had an equity share in the bank, they behaved very differently than if they simply had um, you know, licensing sure. shares in it. I, but I think it's, it's this, I think that th those are interesting things as to why the, the Czech one, I was in the Czech Republic for quite a while, and it, it didn't work in any event because they ended up getting very concentrated 
yeah. because of those funds. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, commercial funds. Yes. Yeah. But um, I think conscription is a really great example that you should push. But it's for slightly different reasons. That I was always uh, for a volunteer army. I thought that'd be great, particularly when I was of draft age. Um, <laughs> but then I. Uh, the, the problem with an all volunteer army, but I had children um, who were of draft age, which if you have independent utility functions. Uh, but the, the thing is, what was really different is, is that now all the protests in Boulder when I was there were all people my age. It's as if the students didn't even know we were fighting anywhere in the world. And so it really changes um, sure, yes, yes. protests, of course, yes. and it's certainly, um, you know, every soccer mom in the world will be out there protesting, you know, wars if you have a conscription. And so I think it's also, it, it really changes what you would call your, uh, so it's just not those who are in the small game, it's also others connected in that society, but it would really dramatically change the alignment um, if you have a volunteer army versus conscription. I think it's a perfect example but, of this. Yeah, do you want to So, the, it, yeah, we mentioned conscription in the paper, but I think yeah. the key thing, and I think it really does, it does work, um, work well. The, uh, and I just actually can put this a little bit in context, too, in terms of like just the, the blocking tradeability among the citizens, and the example there that works is Sparta. Um, and the, yeah. the, not only were all the Spartan men soldiers, they all had estates, and they were not allowed to trade estates. You had to have an estate, and you could not engage in other things yeah. like commerce. Right. So there, you know, this is the citizenry all voting to restrict the citizenry. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so I think it's it's not just it's not just the outsiders, but then a similar thing when you think about sort of the, the Spartan example, and also what what Aristotle was saying, which is of course not independent, <laughs> right. Spartan example, but in terms of conscription. When you think about the decision, if it's the case, you know, what, what, at least what we're looking at is, is this key thing is, do you know what position you're in? If what you do is you have a lottery for the draft and you make a decision at some point in time on whether to fight a war, the order of those things matters. Yes. If you have a conscription and then you decide what war to fight, people know whether they're in the military or not. And so you're going to wind up, you know, if it's, if it's unwilling people being forced into the military, they're, they're going to be just like Aristotle was saying. They're going to, there's a longer quotation there. He's saying that these people are unwilling to fight. Um, but if what you instead did was you made a decision collectively whether to fight a war, and after that, <clears throat> then you just group people randomly. Now you've aligned incentives. Yeah. You have this misallocation because there's people who are, you know, pretty interested in going in the military <clears throat> and would be willing to do it as a you know, volunteer with pay. And there's other people who really don't want to go, and so you've got this real misallocation if you block the exchange there. But again, the but, misallocation yeah. is predicated on, the, on what Michael was talking about earlier on, which is a fundamental gap between those who are willing to pay and the majority, right? Even the majority. So I wonder if there is a, a cut point where the majority, majority rule stops being efficient, but it's, it's, a, it's a cutoff, right? And it depends on the relative size of the um, of, of those who are willing to pay and those that actually have an interest. Because the the check example and the Thatcher's example, you are basically forcing people that wouldn't otherwise care to care, right? And so you are you are shifting the range, the number of people that have an, a vested interest in in alignment. Um, to the point that actually people care about it, as opposed to like the game example that we talked about earlier, um, where you have a, a, a much larger gap between those who have an incentive to be aligned and those that just don't. Mm. Um, I don't know. It's just... Yeah, that's a good thing to look at. Is sort of is, if there is there some some point it's sort of the, the if there's some kind of essential you know percentage that just don't care or, right. or just have no willingness to pay or no. And that in turn has an implication for the kind of public goods that you're looking yes. at, like the defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can. Yeah. Yeah, that that because, because a whole, adding a whole bunch of people into the distribution that have a zero willingness to pay is, is really easy. Right. Um, it's a super simple assumption. So we just have that uniform distribution that we do, and then just add in a bunch of people at zero, or pile up.
so we, we could do that. That would be worth. That would be. Yeah, worth I mean, it. alternatively, you could think about the hunting example as not being people with zero willingness to pay, but just willingness to pay below the cost. Like, I'd yeah, be willing to yeah, hunt if it were, right. you know, cheap enough. It's just that I don't really want to go out, get up at five in the morning, go out in the woods, I and camp around. Or yeah, or at some point. Well, you could imagine could hunting in this. Well, well, imagine this form that uh, you know whatever your favorite food is comes traipsing across your lawn, and all you've got to do is press a button, and it turns into a cooked dish. I mean, then you'd say, okay, well, wow, I'm going to hunt. So, so we can sort of think about. You know, that's the other way to do it. Is think everybody's got a willingness to pay, a positive willingness to pay. Just some yeah. are, some are smaller. Well, I think a lot of it too is you could also think of it as a subset among hunters. Say people that go hunt deer, um, you know, they may all have some willingness to pay to sure. hunt something like a bighorn sheep, but not very many of them are willing to pay the market price. It's by definition, I mean, just the market price of a bighorn sheep has got to be sufficiently high that most hunters aren't willing to pay it because there just aren't that many bighorn sheep. So just, just by nature of the biology. Um, but the question is, do you want to just allocate those rights uh, randomly and not tradable, allocate them randomly, not tradable or non tradable, or just auction them off? And I think that the, you know, that's, that's where we're really coming from here. But, the, but your point's really well taken, because I think what that might be able to do is, is, especially if we add in, say, some pile of people with a zero willingness to pay, and then see what, you know, what assumptions we need to make there. And I think then it would just boil down to whether that constituency that is possible to pay is that the constituency that might flip things. Because um, yeah, they, they care. Hunters care a lot more. Yeah, hunters are going to care a lot more about hunting than non-hunters. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, then there's other people who come in. They want the fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, and they're voting on that. And other people are, right. you know, voting on, you know, they want green energy or something like that. But you know, we've got this this swing constituency with respect to hunting, and that I think would make sense. And I think just it also just empirically, the fact that but you don't see a lot of clamoring to undo the, the fish and wildlife regulations. Not everybody's happy with them, but it's something that's worked relatively smoothly for a long time in the United States. So just there's something there that at least the, the very interested constituents think is okay. Yes, the question is what? <laughs> Dean has, been, has been waiting to add to the uh, college basketball question. For a while. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so I, I find the, the whole thing just isn't sitting together for me. It seems like there's a bunch of strands. So the Aristotle quote, is about the common field system. It's, it's Ostrom style common property. Uh, we mix uh, <coughs> parcels and so on. Um, and the model is about pricing in a direct democracy. The applications are really complicated agency interest group issues in a, in a representative democracy. And the, and the model's trying to be very general and hit things as different as uh, hunting rights and rent control and, and uh, uh, military conscription. I just don't see that your model is, is that general here. And when you get to things like rent control and the hunting stuff, I mean, you've left out agencies, you left out really different interest groups who shape the policy. And so I don't know what, uh, you know, <coughs> the model isn't going to explain optimal natural resource pricing. There's a lot of pricing out there by public agencies of natural resources coal, oil, all sorts of stuff. There are a lot of lotteries outside hunting and rafting and so on. You don't, you, I don't think you have anything to say about when you get them and when you don't. I mean, as far as I can tell. Um, so it's, uh, it, you know, the model is so general and then the applications are just uh, full of so many institutional details. Something's not uh, working for me. I don't know if it's, it, if it, you need just to zero in on one particular application and then and have a model crank out some things you look at more carefully or sort of maybe maybe back away from, because we start reading about the details of hunting and stuff, especially if you know something about it, you're saying, okay, this isn't quite working and everybody's arguing about which one they like better. And that's, I mean, as authors, that's not really the position you want to be in where everyone's thinking, yeah, I don't know if I like this application. And the, but the model is a very different thing you're trying to get at. Um, and so, that's, and so I'm, not, I'm not necessarily offering any guidance here. It just isn't quite, it doesn't fit together as a package as it sits for me somehow. Um, you know, and again, even when, right when you start with Aristotle, Aristotle, I'm thinking, okay, this is going to go somewhere, and then it, duh, it's not really going that place. And, and then you get, then it's hunting, and I, whoa, and you know, that, I don't know how you want to respond to that, even if you can, really, it may be unresponsible. 
Uh, I mean, I, one way to respond is that, I mean, the, the paper isn't about when you use lotteries. The paper is about why, when you're using lotteries, you're making these things non-transferable. That's, that's, that's what the paper is about. I mean, we use lotteries to raise <coughs> funds for schools. Well, let's go back to wildlife. It's always non-transferable, almost always non-transferable, even without lotteries. Well, that, whatever. So, whatever. so that's. I mean, so you've got. So you've it got, doesn't. Have, we don't need the lottery. It's a non-transfer. You're, somehow you're allocating. It's about when you're allocating through voting, and you're making tra non-transferable. Why? I mean, that's what it's sort of about. Now, now, I. I mean, I. I can agree that what we've got is, is, definitely work to do. To is the state land of father when it sells off the right to, to, to farm or to cut timber? Is that allocation by voting? I guess well, in your model it is. Yeah, well, if, if it, when, the, not, when, the, when the Minerals Management Service leases out Outer Continental Shelf oil, is that allocation by voting? If the, are they auctioning? Yeah. Then that's if, if you auction something to make it non-transferable, then you have to have something else to, to make it matter whether it's transferable. Well, we, but the key thing here is, I think, is what Andy's saying is, if, if you got some, if you're prohibiting, there's not, the only you wouldn't prohibit, you wouldn't have an auction and immediately prohibit trade unless it, it, something else is going to change. So the, the, the key thing here is it's got to be, we need to, the reason why we're looking at lotteries is it's a mechanism where you're going to induce intentionally some kind of allocation that's different than what a market would do. And so, the, you know, think about the, the rent control example, you know, we're not, you know, the original rent controls are usually put in so the incumbent tenants can have the right to live there. So that, at the, at the moment, that may just be the market allocation of those existing apartments. But what happens is, that, you know, over time, and now, you know, you look at who's living in apartments in New York City that have been rent controlled for decades, it's pretty close, you know, in some respects to probably be the, the, like a lottery. I mean, there's people are, these are not the highest willingness to pay people that are living there. So we've got a story that applies to that. But then you, you look at something like, like hunting, or I think it's different than if you're auctioning off the right to, to say, log some area, and then make that, you could make that non-tradable for some reason. But that's a little bit different than what we're looking at. But I think, you know, we want to know is why would you restrict these, these trades? The lotteries, I think, are key because if what we're saying, for example, with rent control is that the tenants in rent control apartments have an incentive to make their rights not tradable in order to, you know, to pre collectively, rights, collectively you know, individually, individually they would benefit to by being able to sell yeah. or sublet their apartment, yeah. just like an individual hunter would be benefit. But, you win that elk you ticket. You would individually benefit from that, but collectively, the group of hunters. And well, then the lottery thing is, I don't know when you, what your model says about when you're going to have a lot. So well, you're it doesn't. Going. It doesn't say when you. Well, except for it. except well, for the, if, if, if tenants in rent control apartments are going to allow more housing, how do they want that allocated? Not to the highest bidder. They want more non-market price housing. But but you, I mean you are raising a reasonable so point, which is so what do, what do they do in some African countries? They just auction to the highest bidder, the lion or whatever, and that's you know that's fine, and that that's one way to do it. And you could do that in the states. And they're choosing not to do that in the states. They, I mean Montana could auction yeah. its elk now, but and it's well, not. there are auctions of permits to hunt. They want cheap actually. Well, and, well that's interesting to know because that's yeah. usually that's it's not cool. done that. Way, I mean so. it's usually a small portion of the total <laughs> allocation. But I'm, all I'm really saying is it's just, I'm just not convinced that sort of your initial motivation for this is going to find uh, application in these complicated agency interest group problems unless you just sort of, unless you just want to focus, you know, it seems like you're trying to do too much, maybe. you got the model, but you want to illustrate some general principles, um, but maybe by going into these, because you know, there's a zillion papers on rent control, I'm sure, out there. And then you're, you know, you imagine because a rent control paper, you get a referee who's a rent control. You know, I don't, I just don't know where. Uh, I'm not made, offering a real focal point for you here, but somehow it doesn't seem like it's optimally structured in terms of a mix of application and model at the moment. Uh, I, I believe that. <laughs> yeah, but I'm that's not, why they're here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's why they're giving. Yeah, yeah. I kind of like. I kind, I kind of like you to look at more small. Uh, something the applications with that are closer to um, direct democracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe city government or, or some stuff like that, or community. Switzerland. Switzerland. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, anyway, that's that maybe is a, a linkage. Then you don't worry about agencies so much. You don't worry about different interest groups uh, um, and so on. But that's yeah, that's a very good point. 
right, Rob, last word. Oh, thank you very much. That's uh, <laughs> extremely helpful. Um, it's, uh, you know, this, this is a, an absolutely first draft paper. Um, and I think, you know, Dean's point here in terms of, you know, Santi, we, we actually have, uh, have an empirical section that, that is not in the paper because it doesn't fit. So, <laughs> so but you've, uh, but actually, in all seriousness, though, you've, you've given us some really good ideas about what we can do because you know, we're planning to write more than one paper on the, on the topic. So uh, the, the comments are really, really helpful. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.